Good to be here. Good to have you here. Open your Bibles, if you could, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're starting a new series today. Actually, we kind of started it last week, but it was Father's Day, so, you know, it wasn't really the proper time to start a series, but so this is the official beginning, and I'm speaking today on the supernatural life map, and uh, I've been teaching on uh, life mapping for, I don't know, eight, like 18 years now, something like that, and life mapping basically in, how can I say this, it's basically taking the the ingredients of what have been given to you in addition to your experience, life experience, things like that, and and planning out and figuring out where you're headed. And so that, I was trained in business to do that years ago, like 30, 40 years ago, as a, I was a business trainer, and that influenced church, church influenced that, so lo and behold, you get this life map training, which we've been doing here for a number of years now, and I've traveled around the world and done it. Said all that to say that this, this, what I'm doing today is kind of not like that. That there, the Lord has been showing me some things. That was my introduction. Whatever you knew about that, that's not it. <laughs> so do not look at that anymore. Look over this way. From now on, uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the move of the Spirit in our lives and how we construct things in our lives in order to produce a better future. Because since then, I mean, I knew this in my mind. Let me just tell you what happened this weekend. Uh, it's really loud up here, by the way, if we can uh, get the monitors down a little bit. But... Um, my, my grandson Moses is over at our house. You know I have a Moses story about every month. And uh, he's five, almost six years old. And th- his latest thing is he's writing books. So he's, he does like a uh, you know, table of contents and, and then a book. And so he came in, uh, yeah, he's five going on six. Now these books are all illustrated with no writing at all. But they're, they're really powerful. And because uh, I'm his grandfather and I say so, they're very powerful. But uh, he came into our family room yesterday, and uh, his mom, his grandmother, and myself were all there uh, just chatting and talking. He said, hey, I'm going to do an illustrated book. Who, who wants a book? What topic do you want? Raise your hand the highest. I didn't get my hand raised high enough. My daughter raised hers highest, and so he ended up doing a book for her. And uh, then he comes back in a few minutes later. It doesn't take him long to do these books. And, uh, and then Cindy raised her hand highest, so I forget what he did it on, but, you know, flowers. Flowers? Very good. It was nice. Very ladylike. And then he, uh, he came in, and, and I got my hand up high on this one. He goes, okay, Papa, what do you want to do it on? I said, let's, let's do it on uh, Bible, you know. He's all excited about it and everything. And, and, and I said, let's, let's do Moses, because that's your name. Do it on Moses, you know, in the Bible. And Cindy jumped in and said, why don't we do it on Noah? Because Noah, you know, has good, there's good illustrations. You know, you're five years old, drawing a boat is pretty easy, so I get it. And I said, oh, yeah, Noah would be good too. He said, why don't we do it on Jesus? I said, well, that kind of is the central theme of the Word of God. I said, sure, let's do it on Jesus, you know. And, and you know, it was none of that, Papa, you should have known this thing, but... Uh, I get it. So he went in there, you know, and, and he, did, he did two illustrated pages with the table of contents. And the illustra- first illustrated page was Jesus on the cross. Jesus' head was about two-thirds the size of the cross, which I think is a prophetic picture that he is the head of the church. <laughs> his body was real small at the bottom, but his arms were really long, reaching up <laughs> onto the ends of the cross. And he came over and he showed me. He said, see, Paul, Paul, how there's nails in his hands? I said, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like right out of the, I mean, he's teaching me about the centrality of Christ, being Christocentric, you know, and, and, uh, and then you turn to the next page and, and Jesus is in the tomb. He had it all down, really important parts, and it thought, I, you know, as soon as I thought about it, I thought, hey, he's got it really, right now at age five, he's got the centrality of Christ and Christianity locked down in a two-page book with no words, totally just by illustration. I thought that's brilliant. I said, if all of us could get that, you know, we just get an understanding that our life is not, that, that Jesus is not one of the pie pieces on the, the understanding of the wholeness of our lives, and you spin the wheel, and sometimes I'm working, and sometimes I'm at home, and sometimes I'm a family man, sometimes I'm a husband, and sometimes I'm a religious man. 
It's not like that. And so he gets it that the centrality of it is Jesus Christ. Jesus is not one of the pie pieces on that pie chart that you have flown around in your life, but he is actually the hub of the wheel. And Christianity is about Jesus being the hub of the wheel. And so if you're here today and you're just here because, well, that's what I do on Sunday mornings, you're, you're kind of missing a big part of what this is all about. Jesus Christ's passion and desire, which is what I want to talk about today, is infused in the very foundations of your life. The Christian life. Now, we all have natural foundations in our life. Where we were born, I have dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of Ohio and West Virginia. So I've got dual citizenship. I've got roots that are in West Virginia. I was born in Cleveland. My, my family roots are there. So there's this, there's the, I'm, I'm a dual citizen. And I understand. So my roots are dictated by the theories and the understandings of living in West Virginia and Ohio. And also 10 years in Canada. And you acquire various things over time because in truth, we are wanderers on this side of heaven. Everybody know that? And we're just wandering. I mean, I talk to people all the time and I, I hear the story. I, you know, I love hearing people's stories. As long as they're not too long, but I love hearing them and they, they're powerful. You know, when you tell a story, it's like, whoa. And the story usually involves, uh, you know, I was here, I didn't know why I was here, and then I went over there and I found out maybe this is where I need to be. And then I met this woman and we got married and then we had children. You know, it's this, it's this wandering around through life as you're collecting various puzzle pieces, trying to put this puzzle together, you know. And it's true because outside of the Garden of Eden, after the Garden of Eden, it all became wandering. <laughs> there was no wandering in the garden. In the garden, which is the idyllic picture of the kingdom of God, created, I believe, literally on earth somewhere between the Euphrates and uh, in the Mesopotamia region, region over there, Tigris and Euphrates area. In fact, really, up until the time of Abraham, they still believed there was remnants of the garden over there, and that the people who lived in that area that they believed was, was the Garden of Eden lived to be hundreds of years long. There was some still residual anointing upon the ground, whether that's true or not, but that's what they believed during that time. And some even believe that Abraham was looking for the garden. When in Genesis, the Lord said, leave the fa your father's house. See, leaving your father's house is hugely significant because when you leave your father's house, you're leaving the foundation of your life to go somewhere else. And in this case, depending on who you listen to, that foundation may not have been very good. He was in Ur. Everyone say Ur. <laughs> you are. Ur, that was the name of his city. Not too exciting. I don't know what their sport teams were called, but Ur is pretty easy. Ur, he was in Ur. And he started going up the Euphrates River because you never want to wander too far from water, particularly in ancient times. And so he follows the trail as if he's going up to where the Garden of Eden was. He comes to a place called Terra. And in Terra, he is really called to separate. He's called to move in a different direction. He's called to move into a life of dependence. He's called into a separation. It's a picture. Now, remember, Abraham is the father of our faith. Abraham is the one who cut a covenant with God. And in his covenant with God, the Lord told him, he, he would follow the Lord. And the Lord said that I will make your name great. I will, I will uh, uh, make you into a nation. I will bless the families of the earth because of you. It's a huge thing. And the Jewish race was born out of Abraham. And we get adopted in faith in Jesus Christ. We are adopted into that that Jewish race also. We are Jews also. We are spiritual Jews. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am a Jew. Just tell them that. Right. Jews do very well, by the way. So I got good news for you. There's a real blessing that comes upon that, you know. So anyway, Abraham becomes really in many ways, I don't want to call him the first wanderer. He's the first purposeful wanderer because there were wanderers prior to that after the Garden of Eden when, where everything was purposeful and everything was designed by God and everything worked out well. They, had, they were married to the right person. Adam was married to the right person. Eve was married to the right person. It was designed by God. It was brought in. You go, well, that was the garden of it. No, it's the design of the Lord. It's what the Lord really intends is that he can bring somebody, call it your soulmate. I don't like that term. Call it your soulmate or whatever you want, but God's got somebody that he wants to, it's his ideal is to bring somebody to you. Now, if you, this is a whole other sermon for another time, but if you get out of, if you get impatient and you, you, latch on to somebody else that is not that person that God's really wanting to bring to you, which you will know because great joy will surround that and peace and all those kinds of things. But we try to make pieces of the puzzle fit. 
Well, I think this can work out. I can fashion this man to be the man I want him to be. I can fashion this woman. I, it's just a matter of time. Once they're with me for a while, they will change. <laughs> yeah, let me just tell you from the thousands of people I've talked to over the years that don't, that don't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work because there's resistance to you imposing yourself upon someone else. It's supposed to be a flow of one with another and the sense of discovery of one another and the joy of that. And you can discover that in a thing called a dating period of which I say should be two years long. I know. Now, the older you get, I go to one year. If you're over 50, one year long. But there needs to be four seasons. I say this all the time because you need to, you know, if you're marrying me, you need to meet spring Steve, <laughs> summer Steve, fall Steve, and winter Steve. Winter Steve is a little aggravated. Because Winter Steve has no sunshine in his life because he lives in Cleveland. But anyway, you want to see this man in each season. You want to see this woman in each season so you understand. So that's the downside of being, we're out of the garden. We're in the garden. That's the intention of God in the garden. Adam had the perfect job. He had a God-given job. He had a God-given lady in his life. She had a God-given man in his life. They were perfectly matched together. He had never quoted a poem before in his life until he saw a woman and he goes, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now, howbeit that poem was a bit self-serving, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, a typical man. But anyway, yeah. as self-serving as that was, there was a sense of unification together, and, they, and, and then they walked in the cool of the day with the Lord. I mean, what, what better relationship? You're all there like, I would like that. Well, ever since the Garden of Eden, everyone has longed for the Garden of Eden because the Garden of Eden is actually the kingdom of God. There's a homesickness within each one of us. We long to be in Eden. The Bible even says over in Isaiah, he'll turn your wilderness into the garden of the Lord. Another place in Isaiah says he'll turn your wilderness into the garden of Eden. I mean, there's this passion throughout history, beginning really with, with everybody, <laughs> but especially Augustine in the third, cent, third, fourth century, he started talking about it so much as the Roman Empire was collapsing. He's thinking, there's a better city. There's a better garden. That's where the whole term garden city came up with. If you go to England, they call certain cities garden cities. Because it's the blending of the Lord in the sense of being organic in a garden, but also having a structure that is built. It is a, it is a house that is in a garden. It is a home that is in a garden. It's fixed, but it has... It has the freedom of roaming without having to not be away from home. It's your yard. It's your garden, as they say in England. And so there's this sense where you build something. Here's the weird thing about it that I'm still figuring out. But the Lord is actually building his house with you. You are called in, in 1 Peter living stones. So he takes you as a living stone and he... He puts you together, well, maybe with mortar. I don't know what he uses nowadays, but he was a builder. He's a carpenter. And so he takes you and, and puts you in with other people. And he says, this is a holy habitation that is arising before the Lord, a house of worship. And there's Christians today, particularly in America, this is what's amazing. When you study the Word of God, I don't, I don't want to get into big arguments with anyone today, and I'm going to leave real quick after the service anyway. <laughs> So if you want to argue, go up to Jake. He'll know all the answers to this. But uh, Christianity is not primarily individualistic. Just think about that for a minute. It's not just about you. I know we want it to be, that, and, and American Christianity has described it as it's all about my life and what it's going to become. And tell me more, prophesy over me. I need a prophetic word for my destiny. I'm, I'm going to do big things with God. Hey, get out of the way, get out of the way there. I'm before the prophet. I want the prophetic word. Me, 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 me. I mean, it's, I get it. It's all that. Selfie, 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 selfie. Here I am with Bill Johnson. Here I am with Graham Cook. Here I am with Steve Witt. I mean, we got all these, <laughs> these selfies. I just wanted to put myself in that grouping of guys there. <laughs> felt really good, made me feel good, because it's about me. It's about me. <laughs> I, it, it's not just about you. In fact, when you read through Scripture, it's a little unsettling. For God so loved Steve, oh no, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
And then you start to look through scripture and it's like he's wanting us to kind of do stuff together. He's wanting us to be welded together. He's wanting us to kind of learn to like one another. And so he says that we are living stones fashioned with others built into a, a huge temple of the Lord. And it's, it's like the Lord's wanting us to actually love one another. In fact, uh, I've mentioned before in 1 John, you know, where it says, uh, how can you say you love the Lord and you hate your brother? You do not know God. I mean, his love is not in you. I mean, but in America, we form this Christianity. It's very, it's very personalized. It's very independent. So I'm a believer. What, what, what body do you belong to? What church you belong to? I'm a part of the, I'm a part of the universal church. I'm never quite sure what that means. Uh, I, I suppose I understand that you, you're like many others who have committed your life to Jesus Christ. But the truth is, when Jesus designed the church, by the way, he's the one who did it. So if you have any complaints about the church, expressed in whatever way, Jesus is the guy who started this whole thing. He, they are called out ones, ecclesia. They are called out. Come on. Come out of darkness into light. They came in and they are fashioned together. Even the original word ecclesia talks about that, coming together to solve societal problems. So there's something about we come together as an empowerment. Better are two than one. Uh, the, the reward is greater. I mean, there's, there's a sense that one will put 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight. He's called us together because he is building a house. And this yearning that we all have in our wandering, this is what we don't understand sometimes. I don't, I'm still learning this. But your wandering around in life is you seeking after that kind of a relationship with God where it's not just about me. It says in Galatians that, that uh, something I cannot remember right now, but it's very good. It says... Uh, Oh, it's the great exchange of heaven. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives through me or in me. So the sense we're like Christianity is about you passing in your passport to receive a different passport. And see, we run into this in America, and I got in trouble in Middleburg, so I got to be careful what I say here. I learned from Middleburg before I bring it out here. Pause for a message from your sponsor here. Let's see which one might uh, How you vote does not determine whether you're a Christian or not. <laughs> I mean, I see it all on the internet right now. Oh, okay, you call yourself a Christian and you voted for Hillary. You voted for Trump. I mean, according to the internet, you cannot be a Christian and have voted for either one of them. No, I get, I get there's, you know, we, do you understand we are citizens of heaven, but we're also citizens of the United States. Citizens, this is not real popular to communicate publicly, but citizenship of heaven uh, transcends your earthly citizenship. Now, I'm thankful for America. I've been all over the world. I've been to 30 countries, and every time I come home, I don't do this, but I think about it, kissing the ground. It's like, I love America. As, as, as corrupt at times as it is, as racist at times as it is, the difficulties and challenges, I still love it because at its core, I think God's got his hand on this nation and is going to do something great with it. Yeah. So that, that's why I love America. And I hope every other country loves their country equally well. But I understand I'm no fool. I understand this is not a perfect system down there. My foundation is not being built on where America goes. And Augustine in the 4th century, he saw, he was 58 years old. So he's just a little younger than I am. He saw, basically, his America collapse in front of him. And we don't know that that, I mean, history would say America will eventually collapse. I'm not speaking doomsday here. I don't believe it's going to happen in my lifetime. But I believe that, there are, that this nation could go on. Rome went on for arguably a thousand years. The United States is about, what, 230 years old, something like that? So think about it, being a part of a, of a nation an empire that was four times the size of the United States, uh, history-wise, four times as old as the United States, huge power, and you're 58 years old and everything's crumbling in front of you, and an epiphany came to Augustine, one of the greatest uh, philosopher theologians of all time, who really shaped Western culture. Well, and I've been studying him a lot lately. I've studied him over the years and revisiting it lately. I'm realizing at 58 years old, it was all collapsing in front of him. Barbarians were coming uh, over the rivers and over the walls. They were tramping out everything that was decent. And it'd be like watching foreigners in Washington, D.C., burning down the White House and whatever. I mean, what would it do to your heart? 
And what fears would be there about your future? And so this brilliant man began to shift his understanding. He immediately starts to write a book in order, first of all, to defend Christians who are being blamed by the Romans for the destruction of the empire. So what he does, he writes a 2,000-page book. A 2,000-page book in, in ancient times describing the city of God. He talks about the city of God and the city of man. And he describes as it having two different foundations, although they, they interplay with one another and they overlap because you are a part of the city of God that is established in the city of what he called the city of man, which is like Cleveland. So we are a city that is in a city. We have influence, we have power. And you know, I've mentioned this before, I've studied this and I'm trying to figure out why it seems like God seems to move powerfully through secondaries rather than primaries throughout Scripture. There are some primaries, but they're rare. By primaries, I mean people that are in ultimate charge of a situation. Most of the key people like Nehemiah and Esther, Daniel, Joseph, all of them are secondaries. They rise up with huge influence and shape entire nations. So in one sense, it doesn't matter to me, and I, I'm saying this with all due respect to our politics and everything else, whoever's in office can be directed by the prayers of the saints. Did you know that? The Bible says they're... They're like the, what is it, the hands of the, the heart of the king is in the hands of basically the believer. There's the ability to shape your neighborhood as a believer, even though you may not be in charge of the neighborhood. There's the ability to change Cleveland, even though we may not, you know, I love, yeah, we try to get mayors elected. We know since the 80s we've been doing this. If we get a Christian in office, everything will change. Yeah, sometimes it gets worse. Because they may be good Christians, but they're poor administrators or poor politicians or poor governors or whatever they are. And so it's not a perfect thing. What we need is we need people that are not bound into the arena of, this is not my message today, I have no idea why I'm sharing this, but people that are not bound by the arena of politics, but they understand that Jesus is Lord and he is the foundation in their life. And so this roaming throughout our life, do you understand that everybody is roaming, everyone's outside the garden, and the only hope they have is to find the garden of God, which is the kingdom of God, in you. You are the garden of the Lord. I know it's a little scary, but it's true. Turn to the person next to you and say, the garden's inside of you. It's the kingdom of God. Tell them that. Okay, watch this. Abraham is the great wanderer, of the, the purposeful wanderer of the Old Testament. So that was my introduction. <laughs> Hebrews 11, I did tell you where I was, right? Hebrews 11, verse 9 through 10, look at this. By faith he, Abraham, dwelt in the land of promise. So remember, he was going up the Euphrates River. The Lord said, get out of here and go somewhere else. Be led of me. He wanders away from water, which is very dangerous to do. Went into a wilderness area, and he ends up notably by a New Testament writer recognizes whether Abraham understood this fully or not. He said, Abraham, and by the way, this week's the first time I ever recognized this. I know. It may not be, but at 61, you think it's the first time that you've seen it? I may have seen this hundreds of times, but I only remember this time. It says, by faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise. Everyone say land of promise. He, he got there. It was pretty easy. He just left the river Euphrates, followed the voice of the Lord. He ends up in the land of promise. This becomes the place that Moses fights to get to after they end up in bondage in Egypt hundreds of years later. But he's there. He's scouting it out for future generations. He's in Israel. He's in what's known as the traditional Israel. A land of promise as in a foreign country. Now here it is, dwelling in tents. Now here's the thing of the Old Testament. This is a quick Old Testament understanding. The Old Testament is about a wandering toward the Lord. Whether you're talking about Israel or whatever else, it's all, we're trying to regain the understanding. We're trying to get back to the garden. The garden is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ opened the gates to the garden again, called his kingdom, and invites us back in. So why? What does that mean then? If we're in the garden, I'm talking about our innards, our internals, our interiors are in the garden. Even though in the exterior we realize Cleveland is not the garden. But something inside of us says that I am the garden of the Lord with other people joined together. We are influencing this city. We're like growing up all over the place. I don't even see it, man. The kingdom of God is coming 
and filling this city up, you know, and it's going to fill this state up and it's going to touch this nation as prophecies have already come forth speaking to that. But we align ourselves as one of those cogs in the mechanism. We have it, by the way, Jesus recognized this and he, he recognized this understanding that we, he's building a huge house. He's building a huge city. He wants you to build your house and your part of that, that peace puzzle. He says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you and in my father's house, are many mansions, some interpret it rooms. In other words, he's building a big house and you get to have a house within the big house. He's planning a subdivision of the kingdom of God and you get land in the midst of that. It's not all about you. It's about you and your neighbors making up this house of the Lord. And that house is gonna have huge influence. So Abraham comes into the to the promised land, which is what we're all longing for. Our promised land is a life in Jesus Christ with the fulfillment of everything that he's called us to do. So you look at Israel, you look at their wanderings, you look at their unbelief. Unbelief kept them out of the promises of God. Even believers, even believers who've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, some of them never come into the realization of the promised land, the promises of God. They lived their whole life wandering around. I mean, those people that were wandering in the wilderness in numbers were, were all people that were, they were Jews, they were followers of God. And they got right up to the point of Kadesh Barnea, they send in the spies. The spies come back and they go, oh my God, it, it, it's amazing land, but it's really bad too. The good news is, they're grapes the size of your head. And they're like, wow, wow, yeah, it's amazing. Honey flows from the mountains. Wow, I want to go there. Oh, no, wait. There's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is there's fortified cities over there. The bad news is, is that there's giants in the land. In fact, you know what? We talked amongst one another when we were over there, and we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. I mean, they are so deflated by it, 10 of them, that they pollute an entire generation. They believe it. In fact, the Bible, I was just reading it this week. It's in there, and I, I'm right. It said they wept all night. All day long, they why did you warn me, my brother? Why didn't we just stay? In Egypt, in Egypt, we had leeks and onions by the Nile. Why didn't we stay back there? At least we had leeks and onions. Our breath was terrible, but, but we read something now. We're going to die here in the wilderness. Our bodies our corpses are going to fall in the desert, fall in the wilderness. You know what happened? The Lord thought, as you've said, I will do. And so they wandered around for 40 years until every corpse fell in the desert, except two men. Two men who came back. And here's the deal. They all saw the same thing. All saw the same thing. But Joshua and Caleb had a different report. And so we are the people with a different report. We're the people that are building something that is gonna give hope to people that are wandering. But if we're wandering with them, oh my head, I don't know where I'm going either, but we'll find out something along the way. I don't know, just, I don't, no, we can't be that way. We're a people, we're, we kind of look like we're wandering with everyone else, but actually, I know exactly where I'm going. I know what I wanna be. So when you're talking about a supernatural life map, the first thing you gotta get down is Jesus Christ is my foundation and where I end up is where he's gonna call me to go. I am heading for the promised land. I'm heading into the promises of God and when I get there, I'm actually gonna tear down the strongholds that are there and I'm gonna build houses. I'm gonna establish community. We're gonna rebuild ancient cities. We're gonna bring the kingdom of God here on this planet in this lifetime. Is it going to be fully expressed? No, because Jesus needs to come back. But Cleveland is a city that's calling to be restored. Is it going to take a new mayor? If we get the right mayor in there, I'm telling you that's a great thing, but maybe not the best thing. The best thing is for every person here in their household, in their understanding, with their foundation. I'm talking about spiritual foundations now. With a spiritual foundation, you communicate something of strength that others will look to and say, how might I get that shalom? And by the way, shalom, as I mentioned before, Michael mentioned this morning in our, in our uh, 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 worship time uh, communication, he, he mentioned that uh, shalom is not just, you know, shalom is not peace like we know peace. You know, our peace is defined by having a babysitter for two hours. <laughs> That's peace. It's amazing. 
No children were asking me anything. You know, I, I talk to millennials. They tell me this stuff, you know. If I could just get a babysitter for a couple hours, you know. And I would offer to help, but <laughs> I wouldn't be a great babysitter. But I understand that, you know. Or, or if I could just get my feet in sand on a warm beach somewhere. I'll have peace, you know. And you get down there and you realize there's fleas in the sand and they're biting your feet, you know. I mean, not every dream is a dream. Some of them come out and come to be nightmares, you know. So you're, you're, you're just fleas. It's like that's not, that's not the essence of peace. But in American Christianity, we're like, but we define peace as relief. If I could just get some relief, just get some help here. Because someone here, a brother, man, I'm in pain, I'm in difficulty. Help me out. Just give me a little bit of peace. You know, that peace is going to come and it's going to go. But the eternal peace, the substantial peace, that rearranges your whole look of life, rather than just being a little pie piece of religion over here, Jesus at the hub of your life. When he is the foundation of your life, it is sure. And by the way, he's the rejected stone. Rejected by men, but accepted by God. Did you know that's a picture of every one of those living stones? Every one of you will be rejected by men. In America, we do not like rejection. You know, if we, we make a political statement or some kind of, you know, people were arguing a couple weeks ago because, uh, what's his name, used Bible verses to back up his view of border uh, refugees and so forth. Everyone's like, Wah! I mean, I've never seen such an uproar on the internet. It's like, you're, you're kind of missing the point here. I mean, can kingdom stuff influence policy? Of course it can, but it's all in a suggestive way. It's all in an understanding way. You, you cannot force people to do Christian things. That's what Constantine did in the 5th century. If you weren't baptized, they would kill you. You want to love Jesus? Everyone's like, oh, I'm in, man. <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I got it down. And they were far from Christ. So it creates Christians that have no relationship with God. They're just robots. They're, they're following some kind of a religion. And much of America, I, I'm, I should say much, some of America are infested with Christians that have, an, have some kind of an American political understanding of what Christianity is. You are missing the whole point. The Lord loves America. But if America went down tomorrow, the Lord would still be King of kings and Lord of lords. And so when your trust is in him, it's an eternal, America is not an eternal foundation. It's a good one. I love it. It's great. I pay my taxes. I pay my taxes. Where's my microphone? I pay my taxes. But it's not a sure thing. I mean, we've seen 401ks that they can evaporate overnight. 40% down in 08, you know. All your life's work, whew. Just down, panic. What am I going to do? What are you going to do is you're going to trust in the foundation that you've laid in your life, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, he's a sure foundation. So Abraham is moving. He's a, he's a, a transient. He's, he's wandering. But, but look at this. I mean, he, he, is, he is dreaming and waiting for a city who has foundations. That's verse 10. Whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was longing for what all of us now have in Jesus Christ. There is a city whose builder and maker is God. It's in your life. If your foundation is Jesus Christ, I mean, it's a sure foundation. Even if you build with wrong materials, it'll just burn down. But how many of you know foundations typically do not burn? Foundation, you'll go to a house that's been burned down, and I've been to them, a house that's been burned down, you'll go and say, hey, foundation's still there. And they'll go, well, are you going to rebuild on it? Yeah, yeah, they give us enough money, we're going to rebuild on that foundation. You know, there may be a little smoke that you got to clean off, things like that, but the foundation pretty much stays. So even though you may build with wood, hay, and stubble, and the fire comes in your life, as it says in Corinthians, and burns the place down, you still have the foundation of Jesus Christ. Christians still build burning houses all the time. I mean, if your foundation is Jesus, pay attention to who the foundation is. Build with the tools that he's called us to, with the materials he's called us to, gold, silver, precious stone. Now, I'm going to close with this. You know, in ancient architecture, and I have talked about this before, and I've talked about it in my map training. But in the, uh, I'll shoot, what was his name? Vesuvius, first century, known as the first architect. There's been architects prior to that, but he's the first one that brought it into a science that is still repeated even today. He says there's three legs to the, sco to the stool of design and build. The three legs of that stool are in Latin, firmitas, utilitas, and venustas. Firmitas speaks of solidity. 
strength, long-lasting, solid, solid foundation. We built this building out here. I was here every day of the building of this building. I came and watched the footers being poured. I watched the floor being poured. I was in their way all the time. I watched all of it happen. I came by at least for 10 minutes every day. I watched it. Oh, let me tell you, this is, a, this is a solid foundation. This structure is solid in here. It leans toward being green. It's not totally green, but it leans in that way. I mean, it's very easy to cool and heat this building. Uh, so we've, we've got a solid foundation here in the natural. It's a picture of the building that God wants to build in your heart. Build something that will be here 100 years from now. He wants to build something in you, but you've got to make decisions that you're not, he's not just a pie piece, he's the hub of the wheel. Everything in your life, my mate, my future, my career, my destiny, my enjoyment, all my downtime, my studies, uh, my geography, all this is not determined by winds of the, uh, whims of the winds, it's determined by the core value and understanding of who Jesus is and what he's guiding me to do, because he is the foundation. So you've got firmitas. Then we have utilitas, means practicality. So you need restrooms in here. Uh, codes pretty much dictate a lot of the utilitas. I mean, you gotta have uh, ways to get in, easy ways to get out. You gotta have right conduits, everything in the building. They tell you all that to do, and they come and inspect it all the time. But, we, you know, we, we built a building, though, that would have flow into it. So when you come into the lobby, it's easy. You go to the sanctuary to the right, you go straight ahead for kids. It, it's, you know... Uh, 16,000 square feet that's easy to manage and easy to move around. So we got that down. That's the second leg. The third leg, though, is Venustas, which is beautiful. It's beauty. How do you make a steel concrete building beautiful? Uh, colors, carpets, windows. We rose, raised the windows two, to, two uh, feet out there to go to 12 feet. So we can stand in the lobby and see the top of the silo. Why? Because when you walk into the front door, my thought was I want people's eyes to go to the left and see the pond and their heart be refreshed. You know, hearts are refreshed by physical beauty. And you look and it's like, oh, I'm home. And then they see people with black t-shirts on. Say, welcome home. Yeah, friendly people, friendly faces. It's the beauty of what we're building here. I mean, the building's great, we love it, and it's going to serve a purpose. But if there's no beauty, it's just a carpet warehouse. But the beauty of it is Christ in every one of us. So let me submit this to you in closing. This foundation that every one of us are building in our individual lives and also in our corporate life is number one, it's got to be strong. This has to be a lasting foundation. This can't have any kind of additives in it at all. It's got to be firm and strong. The concrete's got to be poured on the right day. It's going to be the right temperature out. Everything needs to be just right because we want this thing to be around for the rest of your lifetime. So you're pouring a foundation that is sure. It is solid. It is strong. It will not collapse. It's not made of wood, hay, and stubble. Gold, silver, precious stone. It speaks to the character of every believer. Secondly, we want a life that's practical. I wish I could spend more time on this. So many Christian lives are not practical. You're going to need a job. You're going to need friends. And God may bring some to you, but don't chase them off. Make friends. Friendly people have friends. The Bible says that. So you open up. You pour out. You realize we're being built together with other people. You start loving on people. You start loving. You start, you know, next week, I, I think I'm going to talk about the, the, the two nines, the front nine, the back nine. But you start, you start loving one another. You get connected together. It's, it's, it's utility. It's practical. And then when you get ready to move, you know you're going to have people that will come and help you move. That's the whole purpose of friendship. You build these relationships. Well, it's very practical, and, and you take time off because that's the right thing to do. I want to, I'm in here for the long haul. I've, I'm living for Jesus Christ. I want to live a long time. So I create rhythms, and I create rituals in my life that are going to carry me through. And I learn to laugh, and I learn to have joy, and I learn to have peace. I mean, some people all the time, or you ask them how's things going, it's like, not, not good. Wasn't going good last week either. I know. Nor last year. In fact, my whole life has really been not good. Well, this is the time right now to move out of your father's house and build a new foundation. I want to tell you something. Even in the midst of the worst trials in human history, Christians flourished. Why? 
because they were not bound to their circumstances. They were not bound by their environment. They had a deeper foundation in Jesus Christ that was firm. It was practical. And you know what? It's beautiful. You know what makes it beautiful? When I think of firmitas, I think of the Father God. When I think of utilitas, I think of the Holy Spirit. He's very practical. I mean, He just moves and creates things and has giftings and all these things, makes things function and work, points toward Jesus. Venustas, though, the beauty of what you're building is Jesus Christ. That's why you can stand and behold the beauty of the Lord on the cross. In my grandson's little book, you know, even though his head was huge, behold the beauty of the Lord on the cross. Why? Because it's the cross that opened the gateway to get the garden of God back into our lives and the gardener himself, Jesus Christ. Don't you think it's interesting that Mary thought Jesus was the gardener? He is. He is the gardener. He's the gardener. He's the builder. Let's all stand up together if we can. So what do we do? Our foundation is in Christ alone. Oh, I should have read that verse, but I didn't take the time. 1 Corinthians 3 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you want a heart, if you want a life, this is your spiritual life map. If you want to begin a map toward a beautiful life, it's in Jesus Christ. Other people may gain wealth, fame, whatever. We know that that all really means relatively little, even on this side of heaven. But on the other side of heaven, it means nothing. So you, you build a life that's eternal, has eternal foundations. There's typically only two things that are eternal in Scripture. One is the Word of God. The Word of God will never fade. It is, it is sure. It is steadfast. So you give yourself to the Word of God. The second thing that's eternal, you know what the second thing is? People. People are eternal. They're temporal on this world, but they have eternal souls inside of them. And so when you engage with other people, you're engaging on an eternal level. You're investing in eternal things. If you give yourself to the Word of God and to people, everything else is going to begin to rise. Jesus Christ is at the core of that, at the center of that. You're going to experience all those things you've ever dreamed of. Let's just close your eyes before the Lord. Who's closing? Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, this morning as we as we open up for ministry time, we want to make sure that there is an opportunity.